Let's take our Bibles and look together in Psalm 91. We're hop, skipping, and jumping through a few chapters here. Having finished up Psalm 85 last time. But Psalm 91, I would like to speak with you about God's secret hiding place. That's an interesting expression, but it comes right from the very first verse of this psalm where it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So you notice verse 1 begins with He, as in the third person, that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. And then verse 2, I, will say of the Lord. He. So it goes back to verse 1. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. So who is the He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High? How is it that any could ever hope or expect to dwell where God dwells. He's too holy. He's too just for any sinner just to presume that they can enter in to that holy place and dwell where God dwells. So that's what we want to look at here. What is God's secret hiding place? Who is the He that we see there in verse 1? And how is it that they, the I, can say with confidence, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. You've heard me express it many times that salvation is not in a plan, but in a person. And it's not in a performance that the sinner does, but it's in the work of of God Himself on behalf of sinners through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see why this is a vital chapter for us to consider. And my text is going to be from verse 1 to 4 for this message, and then we'll come back and look at the rest, Lord willing. But reading on in verses 3 and 4, Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And, of course, the goal is for a person that's hiding to find a place where no one can find you. They love to play hide-and-seek, and it amazes me that there are so many different places. You'd think every place had been found, but no, someone will find a good place, and then you can't see them anymore. Well, that's a simple game. However, in the reality of life, And that's what we're reading about here in Psalm 91. This is not a game. And how it is that as sinners, we need a hiding place that not only protects us. You stop and think about what is it that stands against us. Well, you can say Satan stands against the child of God. You can say the world stands against the child of God. You can say this flesh stands against the child of God. But one enemy that very few that I know of give any consideration to, and that's the very law of God. The law of God that declares that unless a sinner is just as righteous as God himself, that there can be no hope of ever entering into His presence. And that's where a lot of people just rather presumptuously read a psalm like this and they think, well, God is in His secret place and so what I need to do is have my devotions and I need to get aside and close to Him and begin to pray and enter into that fellowship with Him. We know that none can enter into God's presence unless it is through the representative 
in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I believe in looking at this particular portion of Scripture when it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Don't immediately interpret that to be you. No, the He here is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He's the eternal Son of God. John said, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, Psalm 91 begins pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that abides under the shadow of the Almighty. We know that in the Old Testament, everything pertaining to Christ and to God was given in types and pictures and shadows. But the fulfillment was when Christ came and in the flesh dwelt among men. Just like there was the tabernacle in the Old Testament. So Christ came in the flesh. Everything that had been a shadow to that point, when you think of a shadow, it directs to an object from which the sun shining on that object casts a shadow. Well, everything in the Old Testament was a shadow until Christ came and God was revealed in Him. In Him, the Scriptures say, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Just like God's presence was there in the tabernacle. And so that's why I believe here in Psalm 91, when we talk about God's secret hiding place, it's the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ Himself said that, that none can come unto the Father but by Him. And here in Psalm 91, it's a reflection then on how it is that any sinner can approach unto God. Some credit this particular psalm to Moses because you can see, perhaps in your Bible, the different psalms were divided up into different books. And they were all put together in one book called the Psalms. But back in Psalm 90, you can see that this begins a new book. This would be book four of all the preceding books. This is how they were divided up. And you can see under the subheading for chapter 90, it says, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. So for this reason, there are those that believe that Psalm 91 is really a continuation of Psalm 90. Remember, there were no chapter divisions in the original writing. And so these chapter divisions were put in to help us find our place for public reading. This took place back in the 1500s. And I'm thankful for them. But sometimes the chapter division can obscure, if you will, the Scriptures that came before, the Scriptures that came after. And here in Psalm 91, if you go back into Psalm 90, and see how it was that Moses addressed this prayer unto God when he said in verse 16, Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. We see here Moses interceding on behalf of God's children. That's who the Scriptures are written to address. It's those that God has purpose to save. Those that God has chosen and for whom He is their God and their Redeemer and their Protector. And so the prayer in verse 17 is, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Well, how can God's beauty be upon sinners? It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. And He says, Establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Anything that these hands have to do 
let it be God that has established that work. Well, what do these hands have to do but to bring a sacrifice unto the Lord and to worship Him through that sacrifice, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, from there you go into verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God's secret hiding place. It's not that, like many people think, He's just out there, He's in the breeze, He's in the trees, and can't you feel Him? People go out and get mystical and thinking how they're entering into God's presence. God's hidden. And uh, He can only be found where He is pleased to reveal Himself. And we see that even in the Old Testament, the way that God structured the place of worship and how it was that He was to be approached It wasn't going to be everybody and their mother just running into his presence in that tabernacle or the temple. No, it was through a priesthood. And there was that secret place when it speaks there in verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place. There was that one secret place in the tabernacle in the temple called the holiest of holies. There was the outer court where people would bring their sacrifices daily. There was the inner chamber called the holy place. All of it pertained to God's holiness and how he was to be approached. But there was that secret place beyond the veil. There was a veil that divided the holy place and the most holy. And in that holiest of holies is what it's called, there was the mercy seat. It was a box in which was put the law and the manna, and Aaron's rod that had budded. But over top of that box, that was called the Ark of the Covenant, there was a lid that was made of pure gold. And that lid had on it two cherubim whose wings spanned the entire lid, all made of pure gold. What did those cherubim represent? The very presence of God. And when the Shekinah glory, the cloud of glory, dwelt there over that tabernacle, or in that tabernacle, it was over that mercy seat. But that mercy seat could not be approached even at the whim of the priests, and particularly not of the people. No one could enter in but once a year. That was on what was called the Day of Atonement. When the sacrifice was made, Blood was shed and put in a bowl, and the high priest would enter in, but not without blood. And he would sprinkle it upon that altar. I believe the description that we have here in verse 1 is that hiding place. It's describing that place beyond the veil that only the high priest himself could enter into. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that dwells in that secret place. In the Old Testament, it was in type and picture and shadow. But in the New Testament, we see Him actually coming and actually fulfilling, actually entering into God's secret place. And not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with His own precious blood. You say, why do you say that? How do you know? Look over in Hebrews Chapter 6, this is why I love the epistle to the Hebrews, because it takes these Old Testament types and pictures and shows how they are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that's why we see a transition in verse 1. It's talking about Christ dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. He's the only one who could. And then the difference in verse 2, I will say then, why is it that God the Father established His Son to be that high priest on behalf of His people that He's chosen? Well, it's that we might find in Him our refuge and our fortress. But here in Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20, you'll see how the writer describes it. He says, which hope we have, 
again, speaking of Christ, our hope, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. And what do you read there? Which entereth into that within the veil. Just like that high priest was the only one, and that only once a year could enter in, but he had to do it every year because the blood of those bulls and sacrifices could not actually put away sin. It was a covering. That's what the word atonement means. But when Christ came, he actually entered in once for all time, forever, on behalf of his people. That's why in verse 20, he's called the forerunner. Whether the forerunner is for us entered in, even Jesus, made in high praise forever after the order, not of Aaron, that priestly line had to go away. It was fallible. But after the order of Melchizedek, and then as you get into chapter 7, again, there were no chapter divisions. These were put there, but you have to continue to read in chapter 7, verse 1, for this Melchizedek. The word Melchizedek means king of righteousness, but then also he's called the king of Salem, or Salem, which means peace. Remember we saw last time in Psalm 85, 10, righteousness and peace have kissed one another. Well, how have they kissed one another? Well, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this Melchizedek, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all. And there you can see in verse 2, first being by interpretation king of righteousness and after also king of Salem, which is king of peace. But here's the thing, how this Melchizedek represented the Lord Jesus Christ. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. I believe that we could even say that it was a pre-incarnation appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of how He would later come in the flesh and be the fulfillment of what we read there. That high priest who was to enter in beyond the veil. To enter in means to be in the very presence of God. And uh, the only one who dwells in that secret place with the Most High. See, the high priest of old would enter in and come out. That wasn't his dwelling. That's not where he dwelt. But Christ has dwelt with his Father and has enjoyed his presence forever as the eternal Son of God. And yet, coming in the flesh, he manifests himself as God in the flesh. And it's only by his righteousness that he came and earned and established, and his blood shed unto death, that any of us, as is described there in Psalm 91, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. The only way any of us could even find that entrance into the presence of God is going to be through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when it says there in verse 1, coming back to Psalm 91, they shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That secret place in the tabernacle had no light in it. There was light in the holiest place where the candles were lit. And those candles burned night and day. So they would have cast a light through the veil into the most holy place. And therefore would speak there of a shadow that was cast because that veil was there until Christ came and fulfilled it. It's only in Christ now that that veil has been removed. If you look over in Hebrews chapter 8, you'll see this is the language that the writer to the Hebrews uses to describe our entrance now into the most holy place. It's not us 
going in and out at our whim, but it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And there it speaks then, it's actually in Hebrews chapter 9, how that that veil stood until Christ came and fulfilled it. When it says there in verse 7, but un, into the second went the high priest alone once every year. Hebrews 9, 7. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of, his, of the people. That shows they were fallible. But the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. And that's why I say here in Psalm 91, was talking about the shadow of the Almighty. This was a shadow, a type of what was to come because that way into the holiest of all, that's really what we're talking about here when it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is the way into the holiest of all, that holy, holy of holies was not yet made manifest, was not yet made revealed. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing. But here in verse 9 it says, which was a figure. That's why we're studying this. Psalm 91 to see this as a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that what could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience and which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal or fleshly or physical ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. A lot of people think of a reformation having taken place back in the 1500s. No, there was a reformation that took place when Christ came. And how was that reformation fulfilled? Verse 11, But Christ being come, what? And high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once. See the contrast? They entered in once a year. He entered in once into the holy place. That's God's secret hiding place into which none can enter except through Christ. And it says there, having obtained eternal redemption, everlasting redemption, his work being completed. It was forever. You can see for us is put in italic. So it wasn't in the original text. But just reading, having obtained eternal redemption. A lot of people claim that it was for them. But no, it's for those that God has determined. And for whom Christ came and laid down his life. This is not an ali ali in free for anybody. If you'll just lay hold of Christ, then you'll, you can be sure of heaven is your own name. That's not how the scriptures teach it. It's him laying hold of us. It's not me accepting him. It's me being accepted in the beloved. See, the world has it backward. But it's going to be through this person, this work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see in Hebrews 10, it uses that same word shadow. Hebrews 10 verse 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Here in the Old Testament, it's through type and picture. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That was necessary that it be until Christ came. But now, it says, not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. They had to keep coming every year. But in contrast, as you read on here, it says there in verse 9, these are the words of Christ, Hebrews 10. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he, might, he may establish the second. By the which will, notice, we are sanctified. The tense of that is we have been 
sanctified and we continue in that sanctified state. How? When you believe? No. It says here, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And again, once for all. For all is an italic, but read it without it. Once. In contrast to the continual coming in the Old Testament. Once. And again down in verse 14. For by one offering he hath what? Perfected. Those that he is sanctified, he's justified by his shed blood. If the Lord by his Spirit has now brought you to Christ and you have believed on him, it's not that at that moment then your sins are forgiven. That's how it's often preached. Well, if you really want God's forgiveness, then you just trust Jesus and then he can forgive you. No, forgiveness of sins was accomplished in Christ's death. Sanctification set apart in Him accomplished in His death. Justification fulfilled in His death. And it says here, by that one offering, He hath perfected. And it's the same tense. It's a one-time perfecting that the effect or results continue when forever. For who? Those that are sanctified, that have been sanctified. So I believe that coming back here to Psalm 91, this is why we're going to take some time going down through this psalm, but there's the cornerstone right there. We miss that, then the whole foundation is out of kilt. May the Spirit grant us to understand that this one that dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides there under what was the shadow of the Almighty, but now being fulfilled is none other than God in the flesh Himself, but that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way then that any that He represents as the high priest enter in. It's in His person and in His work. And such is the work that Christ accomplished on behalf of His people that... Even the gates of hell, Christ said, shall not prevail against him. This is the assurance. This is the confidence of those whose names were written on Christ's breastplate. Just like the high priest of old bore the names of the tribes of Israel as he entered in. That's a picture. That's a representation of God's elect. Even as Christ prayed in his high priestly prayer. He said, I don't pray for the world, but I pray for those that thou hast given me. So this tells us then how it is that any of us who are God's children enter in to that secret hiding place. It has to be God discovering himself. I go back to the story of my grandchildren liking to come to the house and finding places to hide and every once in a while one of them finds a place no one can find out and so those looking will say okay you got to tell us where you are we can't find you they reveal themselves of course they come out all excited and they're like ha ha i found a hiding place but like i said that's a game that kids play this is not a game it's a serious matter and therefore, it has to be addressed with seriousness. How is it that any of us can have that hope that's described here in verse 2? I will say of the Lord. Let's be careful because I hear a lot of people say, well, the Lord spoke to me or the Lord said to me. You better be careful when you call the Lord to witness because many times what you hear them say is so contrary to Scripture. You're like, ooh. You might have imagined it. It may have come from your depraved, sinful heart, that thought, but it in no way reflects what the Lord says. Let God be true and every man a liar. So when the psalmist here, and again, it may well be Moses, as he was addressing the Father. He was placed there as a mediator, but in type and picture. Not even Moses could enter into that secret place. It had to be through 
a representative, a high priest. But what was Moses' confidence and what is the confidence of any of us that are God's children will say of the Lord. See, that's who gets the glory for entering into God's presence. He is my refuge and my fortress. It's not our profession that's our refuge and our fortress. It's where a lot of people run when you ask them, well, what's your hope of salvation? Well, when I was younger, when I was six years old, I got down on my knees and I said the sinner's prayer, I, I, I. Well, that's not how one speaks that's been taught of the Lord. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. If I have any hope at all of salvation, it's in Him. My God. See, that's who Christ is. He's God in the flesh. And therefore, in Him will I trust. The word trust means that He's trustworthy. A lot of people put their confidence in the flesh or in their profession or in what somebody else tells them. No, let this be my trust. In Him will I trust. So who is it that can say with assurance, as we see here in verse 2, I will say of the Lord. Well, first of all, it's those that only come to God by Him through His bloodshed. Because He is the Most High and Holy One. Secondly, it's those, as we see here, that rest in Him. It's to come to Him as he's revealed in Scripture, secondly, to rest in him because he is the Almighty and Sovereign. Salvation is in his hands. It's not mine. Therefore, I rest in him. When it says there, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. To trust is to rest in him. And you see the different names that are used here for God. He's called the Most High up there in verse 1. He's called the Almighty. And thirdly, here in verse 2, He's called the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. That's where the translators did well. Every time the word Jehovah is used, they put it in capital, all caps. So wherever you see that in reading, capital L-O-R-D, it's referring to Jehovah God, the I Am. You go back to the New Testament, you read how many times Christ said, I am. He was revealing himself as God in the flesh. But those who enter into that secret hiding place, the very presence of God, it's got to be through this one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they come through him, they rest in him, they rejoice. In his salvation. Because he is the Lord Jehovah. When he says here. I will say of the Lord. this Remember these songs were hymns that were sung. Oh how we have to rejoice. In him who is the Lord. But then. Even as it says there at the end of verse 2. Those who come. To God. By him. Trust in Him as their God. You notice that in verse 2? My God. That's what Thomas said when he saw Christ who had entered into that room. He'd not been there the first time after His resurrection. And he'd heard word that Christ had revealed Himself. And he told the rest. He said he's not going to believe based on their testimony. He had to see Him with His own eyes. A lot of people find fault with Thomas on that, but it was the Lord drawing him. And when the Lord entered in and knowing Thomas' thoughts said to him to come put his hand in his side, he could see the where he'd been pierced and he could see his nail prints. Thomas didn't need to do that. He saw. He was given eyes to see and he, he fell. And what did he say? My Lord and my God. My God. I know people use that as a, an expression of, of surprise. 
And uh, they, in so doing, take the name of the Lord in vain. But for those that are truly the Lord's, He is our God. And uh, we find in Him that rest and that trust. And through Him we come and Him alone. So there are really four names for God. God is infinite. But every one of these names applies to He, there in verse 1, that dwells there. How is it that any of us are going to ever know God? It's going to be through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to dwell means that it, He is ever in the presence of God. That's our hope of eternal life, everlasting life, is to dwell with God forever. Well, how are we going to dwell with Him? It's going to be through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But that word, Most High, you may have heard the Hebrew name for God used, El Elyon. Elyon, well, that's who this is, the Most High. You can't have, when it says Most High, you can't have any higher than He is. He is that name given above all names, whereby every knee should bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord. And then the second name for God there in verse 1, Psalm 91, the Almighty. You've heard that song, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Well, that's, that's that name, El Shaddai in the Hebrew. Almighty. It's not this little peanut God that people grab hold of and and carry around in their pocket and somehow think that it's up to them to do His bidding. No. Almighty means that all power, all glory belongs unto Him. And if any are saved, it's going to be by His almightiness. You think about it. What it takes for God who is just and holy to save wretches such as we are. Well, it must be in an almighty way. And it is through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we saw that already in verse 2, that name Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that's the word Yahweh or Jehovah. And uh, everywhere in Scripture, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, as I said in uh, verse 3, my God. Not just a God. You hear people when they say their invocation, they'll say, Oh God. Well, no, my God. Our God is not the God of this world. And that word in the Hebrew is Elohe or Elohi. El is the name for God. It's a prefix that, that is fixed on every other name of God. But it just shows us that there's not one name that we find in Scripture whereby God in His infiniteness can be described. But because of who He is, and when the Spirit of God is pleased to reveal Him in the hearts of those for whom Christ has entered in once with His shed blood, that He is trustworthy and we rest in Him. And that's why verses 3 and 4 to draw this particular part of our Scripture to a close. We'll come back to it next. But you can't understand verses 3 and 4 unless you've properly seen verses 1 and 2. The foundation is in who God is and His holiness and His justice and how Christ has entered in on behalf of His people. In light of that then, we see the blessing of those for whom Christ is that representative. And what does God's salvation bring? Well, it brings protection. It brings comfort to the souls of His people. And it brings care where we find all of our hope to be in Him. When it says there in verse 3, Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, a fowler was a bird catcher that went out there and set a trap to try to catch the bird and take it home and kill it and eat it. Here, it says, surely what? 
He shall deliver thee. The same He of verse 1. He, meaning Christ, is the high priest. He it is that delivers those that He represents from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. That's an interesting word, the noisome pestilence. It has to do with a plague. That, and the metaphor here is when a plague takes over and it's perilous. I mean, that, that word noisome, another way of interpreting that word would be a perilous pestilence that would completely take us out were it not for God being our refuge and our protector and our Savior in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, you could ask, well, who is the fowler? And what is this plague? Well, we know the plague is nothing but our sin. And the snare of the fowler, a lot of people like to say, well, that's the devil. Well, certainly Satan goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the world is a snare, as you read in Scripture. This flesh is a snare. We sleep with the enemy every night. When we lay down our head on that pillow, we go to bed with this flesh which would left to it ourselves entrap us at every turn. And so certainly these are enemies that stand against God's children. So where's our hope? If we did not have Christ, the revelation of Christ, we would seek continue to seek a false refuge from all that pertains to this life and this flesh. But the point here, again, is in the person of Christ. He shall deliver thee. That's what I love about what Christ said, that of all the Father has given him, he would lose nothing. There is our hope whenever we're overrun, even with our own thoughts and fears and trouble and sin. All of these things that, like a noisome pestilence, plague us. Yet in Christ, and because of His finished work, we can't have any better deliverance or protection than in Him. And look how it's put there in verse 4. This is put in such a tender way. This is not just for information, but this is for our hope and our encouragement we're not perhaps immune as children of God. We aren't from physical plagues and pestilence and all of these things that we endure being in this world. Yet, in Christ, in our high priest, who is in the very presence of God, we are protected from what takes others completely into condemnation. And the picture here, that's why I say it's so tender when you read it in verse 4, He shall cover thee with what? His feathers. And under His wings shalt thou trust. If you've ever watched a mother hen with her little chicks going around, and if you'll notice, ever, ever raise a hen and chicks, every once in a while the mother's hen goes up and searching the sky. What's the mother hen looking for? For that noisome pestilence. For that bird of prey that will, will come and swoop down and take up one of her chicks. And I've seen this happen. Where all of a sudden that, that mother hen spreads her wings out. And those little chicks, doesn't matter how many there are, they all run in underneath and she protects them. And I've seen many a hen fight off an eagle or some other bird that would seek to take any one of those little chickens. Well, that's the picture here. We, we see all these, these pictures of Christ as the high priest and the one who enters in, but as if to give us a, uh, an illustration that even a child can understand. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Think of Christ as that hen. And uh, his chicks run and hide in time of trouble. And 
find in Him their hope. And that covering with His wings is their deliverance. And then it goes back again to another picture, that of a warrior. Who is it that fights or has fought on behalf of His people? He's not fighting now. He's seated in heaven. The work has been done, accomplished. He ever lives to intercede on behalf of His own. But here it says, His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. The shield, that's an instrument of protection against the, the fiery darts of the devil as it's described there in Ephesians 6. And uh, the buckler, that word signifies something that is wrapped around a person for his protection. An armor would be a good way for that to put it. But such is our protection in the Lord Jesus Christ. A double armor, if you will. The shield and the buckler. And uh, it's for those for whom Christ has paid the debt. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful psalm. This is for those of us that are the Lord's. And I pray the Lord will give us eyes to look to Him at all times, who is our refuge and our strength.